Hey everybody, it's uh, your old buddy Rob here. Uh, this is the second in a pair of episodes I recorded back to back with Kevin Woodley. Hopefully you've listened to episode 98. We talked about the Vancouver Canucks season as uh, Kevin's the NHL.com beat writer for the Canucks. This one focuses on goaltending. We put our in-goal media hats on, look at a couple of the big stories, both across the season and leading into the trade deadline and the summer, as well as a couple of the bigger trends we're starting to see in goaltending in the National Hockey League. So I hope you enjoy the episode. And without further ado, we will push go. Five, four, three, two, one. Puck short. Okay, let's uh, let's go kind of back to back here because you know how goalies love back to back games. In this case, back to back episodes. We'll flip it through into episode ninety nine, and we'll put the uh, the in goal hat on now and, and talk about goal team and through the NHL this season. There's three specific players I, I wanted to ask you about, and then a couple of trends that that I want to get your thoughts on. The tail end of episode ninety eight. We mentioned Sergei Bobrovsky. As you said at the time, pretty much everyone who'd been paying attention knew he'd be leaving Columbus this summer or perhaps before he may be traded before the deadline I mean what's what how do you see this playing out because there was the instant which got I think blown out of proportion in the media with the whole going off to get showered thing yeah it's not the cool thing to do you can't take the moral high ground if you're Bobrovsky but equally I didn't think the Blue Jackets handled it well maybe it's accelerated the exit I mean do you think he gets traded or do they hold on till the summer I really don't know. Uh, I guess, uh, like, honestly, um, the only reason I don't know, I don't know what the value is. Like, I don't mm. know. And, and that's not a Bob thing. That's a goaltenders in general thing. Like, um, you've the team would have to, A, uh, have a need, um, see him as an upgrade, because it hasn't been a great season since Ian Clark left. Uh, no coincidence. Mm. <laughs> um, and that's not against Bob. I Like, and it's not even against Matt. Like, those two just had a really great... It's not against Manny Legacy either, who's taken over. But, I mean, those two had a really good working relationship. They, they are both... Uh, they they were both on the same page. And I think if you were to take maybe take a look at the Columbus schedule and look at Bob's most successful run of the season, I think it may have coincided with uh, the Canucks and Ian Clark <laughs> going through town a week before and then chatting. So, um, listen... I just don't know what the value is. I, I can't predict what Columbus is going to do. I, I I didn't like how they handled that situation. I'm not excusing what Bobrovsky did, no. but uh, we've seen John Gibson and Cam Talbot both not come back to the bench uh, in recent weeks after mm-hmm. getting pulled from one-sided losses. Now, granted, I don't think either guy showered. I think that's going to be... It doesn't happen very often, mm-hmm. um, and there is no excuse for, for Bob you know, gearing down and getting out of his stuff. But, uh, you know, Columbus chose to make it very public and make an example of him, and they're reaping what they sow a little bit. Like, John Tortorella has always coached by, in some ways, by creating chaos and trying to bond his team together around it. That's always been an element of his coaching style. Um, And I I would suggest that maybe your number one goaltender and one of your most important players might not be the best place to start to do Mm. that. Um, but hey, that's just me. I, again, I know of things that happen around teams with teams without excusing what Bob did that would be just as bad that never become public. Mm-hmm. They chose to put this out there, and I don't think it's a coincidence, and I don't think it's done them any good, either on the ice in the short term or in terms of how they handle this. Like, it hasn't improved their situation. Um, and as much as you, Bob has to be a pro and play through this, um, clearly it, it just hasn't been his best year. And uh, I think that the distraction, it's added to an already distracting season for him and it hasn't helped. So um, it's just, it's just not, it's, it hasn't been a tenable situation. I don't think they're all year. And I do find it ironic that he was the one they chose to scapegoat when you know, his like they knew he was gone mm-hmm. a while ago and didn't do anything about it. Um, he didn't go public. He did everything the right way uh, behind the scenes, privately. Panarin's agent goes public and blows it all <laughs> up. Like they knew Bob was leaving before the Panarin stuff hit. Yeah. So 
this situation, as much as it sucked for Columbus to have to lose a two-time Vezin Trophy, they knew he was leaving, so they had an opportunity to do something about it. They didn't, and it's just gotten worse from there. I think even earlier in the season, there may have been an opportunity to move him and bring in a goaltender in exchange. Uh, maybe even one who was on an expiring contract, but one that could help you win now. Because mm. um, that's the problem, right? If you move Bob, what's your, you know, what does that do to your chances to win now? Because they've got some some nice pieces. Um, I don't think they're as good a team as a lot of people think, but they've got some nice pieces. And and, and you know, so like, you know, for example, could you have moved him? to the Islanders earlier mm-hmm. um, in exchange for a Robin Lehner who maybe you could have retained on more of a discount, although Lehner and, and even even the new Lehner and Torts don't seem like a real good, <laughs> good idea, right, I yeah, think, yeah. to any of us. But, you know, like, could you have done a move like that? And I just think that, you know, now Lehner's rocking, what, a 931, one of the best goalies mm-hmm. in the league, and, and, and I don't think the Islanders would make that deal. So, I mean, I think, you know, in Lou Lamarillo, you had a general manager who – has always desired stability and goal. You know, one of the he's always used to talk about sleeping well at night because he had Marty Berdur. First mm-hmm. thing he does in Toronto is he goes out and he gets Freddie Anderson. And I know for a fact that one of the first calls he made after taking the job with the Islanders was to Montreal to see if Carey Price was available. Yeah. So would he have looked at a two-time Vezin Trophy winner and a chance to get a head start on free agency with him and maybe taken a shot at that, given that one of his two is unrestricted free agent? In Laner and, and and even Thomas Grice may have been an option. Like there's there were opportunities to me probably for Columbus to get out and pass this situation, move him and get some help in goal short term because they've got some nice pieces coming as well. I, I happen to be a big Corpusalo guy. I do find it ironic that they've become more of Corpusalo guys mm-hmm. as an organization. And in the past, they when the Bob was running good, they found excuses to sort of throw Corpy under the bus. Um, and not trust him as much as maybe they should have, and not maybe helped in his development early on. Um, and now they need him, and, and the, as they lean on him, he's showing what he can be. Uh, Elvis Merzlekens, uh is another good piece they've got coming behind him. So, like, I'm not worried about them long-term in goal. I think they have some options, uh, in part because Clark helped them draft some good options. <laughs> yeah. Off, off. You know, like I saw the Russian kid, too. Like, he's, you know... I was really impressed with the Russian goaltenders at the World Juniors, including the Columbus kids. So there's pieces there. I just think in the short term how they've handled this with a two-time Vesna winner. And a guy, to throw a guy under the bus who was a culture carrier before this point, who led through his work ethic and the way he handles, who did everything right in terms of his own trade situation, not going public, handling it behind the scenes, giving you a heads up. I just didn't, I didn't like any of it. I didn't like any of it for the Columbus Blue Jackets. I didn't like, I, I, obviously I'm biased, but I didn't like how they handled <laughs> Give it, and maybe they're reaping what they sow here. So, one of the other Bobrovsky's gone. He's out of Ohio. Potential destinations. We mentioned the Islanders probably having less interest now, but Lena and Grice has had a good season too behind that defensive unit that, that Barry Trotz has done so well with. And the Panthers made some cap space. They're rumored to be interested in Bobrovsky and Panarin. Where does he go, and does he prize money or winning in that decision? Yeah, see, here's a yeah, here's a, that's a good second one's a good question because I'll be honest, I don't know the first one, Rob. I, I really don't. I don't know what the Islanders are going to do. I know Laners had a great season. My impression halfway through that great season, maybe this has changed over the past couple of months. But my impression was that he wasn't going to be the long term solution there. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, that that there were some things that weren't changing and nothing like on the ice in terms of style and technique that and and. A lot of talk in the media from him about, hey, like, you know, they're trying to change me. It's not working right now. And I don't know how well that went over. And he's not a backup. Like, that's yeah. that's the one thing that's clear. Like, he has to be the guy. Um, he's not going to do the work they expect of a backup. He's not going to be that guy out late uh, grinding it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's just, just not, not what he's <laughs> done as a goalie. So that's not a criticism. It's just the, that's just who he is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wasn't sure he was long for there, but that may have changed. And I do think Bob would have been a good fit there, if not, because uh, they don't have much coming yeah. uh, other than, than that. Again, the Russian kid for them, too, that um, I believe, I, like, I don't think he's coming over anytime soon, is my impression. They've got a couple of years to wait. Mm. Uh, Florida, I'll be honest with you, I can't figure out what the hell they're doing. So, can anyone? <laughs> like, really, can anyone? Um, you know, that, what the tough part about that one is I don't know what you do with Luongo. Mm. Um, Clearly, I'm a massive 
Luongo guy. I got to know him here in Vancouver, and so yeah. my bias may be showing there. I, obviously, the age and the health has become an issue. Mm. Um, I think when he's played healthy, he's still capable of being a guy that can carry you. Um, they, he can't be a guy who plays any more than 50 max, probably maybe even 40. You know, he's a half a season guy yeah. right now, I guess, based on the health. I thought they should have a nice package between him and Reimer, but like when they needed to use Reimer to keep Loango rested, they lost faith in Reimer, showed that publicly, sort of undercut his confidence mm -hmm. in their by showing how much they they didn't believe in how he was playing early, and as a result, had to run Loango into the ground. He gets hurt. They go to Reimer. Now he's playing well, and both of them are playing okay. And it's almost too late. Like this is kind of, and how do you fit Bob in there? Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't think Luongo's done yet, and yet unless they know something I don't about health, and and we've got a pretty good relationship, so I, I don't think that's the case. Um, like if, like he's not a guy who like he's a workhorse. Like he's a workhorse, but you're not you're not having him out stay out and practice for forty five minutes after practice. I don't know if all the work that he does to get ready to play with, with his health and with his hip and the hour and a half he spends sort of getting everything loosened up every time he hits the ice, I don't know that that's real ideal for a guy to play 25, 30 games and have Bobrovsky play 50 to 60. So I don't know about fit, but to get back to your second question, a lot of people have talked about Bob wanting carry price plus money. Hmm. I do believe that was the case to stay in Columbus. He was not staying for anything less. I don't think that necessarily applies to everyone else. There is a real desire there to win. I think, like I said, I, I don't think Columbus is as good a team as some people maybe thought. I think he propped them up in years past. And I think he saw that. Mm -hmm. I like, like honestly, like I think the, the chance to win. <laughs> your problem is, I, like, I could honestly see if he wins a cup. Like, I don't know how much longer he plays in the <laughs> NHL. He could right. go home, but the desire to win a cup, like, like this guy is one of those driven guys, and especially with the way again talk about Columbus. I mean, the way they handled some of his earlier playoff struggles, uh, suggesting to reporters that he needed a sports psychologist, like. None of that went over well in terms of him staying. It also is part of what drives the narrative that he would lo love nothing more than to strike down by winning a cup. Hmm. Uh, this guy's this guy's driven to win. So the opportunity to do that, I don't think. I guess what I'm saying in a really poor way is I don't think it's all about money and a big contract and and price plus numbers. It might have been to stay in Columbus, but if there's an opportunity elsewhere, I think you could see him looking for a place to win ahead of a place to to you know sign a big ticket long term deal. And to me terms the key here hmm. and it's not yeah. restricted to bob we're looking at one of the best what should be or should have been until a bunch of them hit the skids <laughs> this should this should have been one of the best free agent classes for goaltending we've had in years i mean barlamoff talbot laner bob uh some really big names hitting the open market and one of the best games of musical chairs for goaltenders that that we've seen in a while now, some of the some of the 1b guys have re-upped um but still, there's a lot of names out there. And I think if you're a team, the key has to be avoiding term. No, yeah. like, like the game's changed. Look at, look, at, look at how the game has changed this year. Mm. Like, and, the, and the goalies that can succeed behind this style of play, that's changing. And it's constantly evolving. And so I think anybody that locks themselves into a super long-term contract with any goaltender right now, is probably honestly making a mistake. Like to me, I would overpay in money and 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 underpay on term every time with a goaltender, and that'd be the trend I would follow up as a general manager. And I know that's easy to say and hard to do, yeah. Because you know, like <laughs> the Jets, you 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 see your locker room and your teammates develop a faith in a guy like Hellebuck, and you're like, they all believe in him. Mm. So of course we want this guy long term. Look, it's taken us this long to find a goalie. We got him. Let's sign him. Let's lock him up long term. And at least they only went six years. Like the idea of an eight-year contract for any goaltender to me, um, you know, even even the best, yeah, um, you know, and it, that's just something I would avoid, frankly. Yeah, no, and I'm, and the goal to, and I'm risking my goaltender union card by saying that. No, I'm not sure you are. I, I think most people see the the sense in that logic, especially with, with the way the game's changing. And even like we've had the conversation this week with Austin Matthews, if. 
you believe in yourself, take the short deal, and then cash in again in a, in a few years' time. And that's the advantage short deals offer. One thing with Borobsky, just before we move on, that I keep seeing brought up every now and again in relation to really his past is the groin, the groin issues. I mean, given he's played, well, 60 games plus in each of the last two seasons, this year a bit of an anomaly, as we've kind of touched on. But I don't see the groin as an issue anymore for Borowski. I don't know how you see it. Yeah, I see that as maybe a little overplayed outside of the fact that he's going... Locking, you know, I think this conversation... It's two different conversations. The conversation... (laughs) Don't lock yourself long term into an aging goaltender. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. It, right, and and there's no question. There is a lot of open and close in Bobrovsky's movement. Hmm. Um, there's a power and a preci- There's a power and a drive and a lot of force on the body with the way Bob plays. And so, if you want to have that argument, if you want to break down his style and suggest that perhaps, um, given the amount of stress that puts on his body, perhaps. He may be more prone to injury as he ages. Fair point, mm. fair conversation. But bringing up past injury history when he has since completely changed how he trains, shed 19 pounds, not just 19 pounds, 19 pounds of almost like almost all of it, it was muscle, <laughs> which mm. is not easy to do no, no. Because, he, because he was training the wrong way. Mm. And he fixed that. And he hasn't since making that adjustment. I don't think he's missed a game with a with a soft tissue injury, lower body related, since 2016, which is right when he made this adjust, adjustment in how he trained. So, like like I said, it's kind of two parts: aging goaltender who puts a lot of stress on his body with the way he plays. Avoid a long term contract with mm-hmm. guy. Hey, I'll listen to that argument. Yeah, for but sure. but talk about his pat. That would be like. That would be like a goaltender that completely changes the way he plays, finds a new goalie guru, mm-hmm. um, does something that significantly alters his ability to stop pucks, like like his system, his approach, and saying, well, no, I'm going to judge him on everything before that. Like It goes back to the old analytics things that goaltenders don't improve um, or can't imp- mm-hmm. improve with time as they age. Um, and, you know, I... <laughs> I, I, I have a tough time with that one. Yeah. Same way I, I have a tough time, well, you know, same, making yeah. blanket statements about Bob from mm. things that happened three or four years ago. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's a lot of goalies have gro- have groin problems, like chronic groin problems. And then every time a goalie has a chronic groin problem, I'm like, yeah, have you checked his hip? Because a lot of times he ends up needing hip surgery, and it's mm-hmm. happened a lot, like a lot of guys. And Bob didn't. Bob was, you know, Bob. They they did the MR. They did the work. Yeah. They checked the hips. It wasn't the hips. It was the way he was training. It was putting way too much stress on the lower body because of the way he played. Mm. Um, but once he changed the, the, the sort of training regimen, he hasn't had a problem since. So I think you judge him in the two years since the changes versus everything that happened leading up to that. Uh, moving on to uh, another guy who's, well, I think he's had a good season, though. Uh, Marty Baron set uh, the tourist fair alight this week. John Gibson. Baron saying he wouldn't have Gibson as, as one of his potential winners for the Vesna this year. I think a lot of people were very surprised by that, given what he's done for the Ducks, the absolute tire fire that Anaheim has been, but still hung in the playoff race up until up to maybe now, the last week or so, they've they've started to drift off. Maybe that kills Gibson's Vesna hopes, but up to that point, his numbers were borderline on historic. Yes, there are flaws in his game, but the way he played this year, I mean, surely he's or was in the Vesna conversation. Where are you on John Gibson, both this year and, and in general as an NHL starting goaltender? Well, I think I get to say um, that I was. He's actually, I've warmed on him, okay? Mm. Um, when they traded Anderson, I publicly said I thought they traded the wrong guy. Uh, Gibson has a, a ton of innate ability, but I the injury history that plagued him, and I should, again, much like, Bobrovsky, you have to put a ask, like a star there because it hasn't. Again, he's changed the way he's trained, but to me, the injury history early was tied a lot to the way he moved right, yeah. and the way he reacted to saves. There is a ton. He comes off the puck a ton. He opens off the release a ton. He opens up in movement even more so. Actually, off the release. It comes and goes. He can actually be pretty good at, at, at sort of staying on top of pucks. Mm-hmm. But in his movement especially, 
he opens up and there's without getting into the fine biomechanical details he essentially pulls his body apart different things counter rotation and the stress that puts on the body naturally is going to lead to the injuries that plagued him earlier in his career now he's trained in a way that's helped him keep it together more in those movements uh and i have liked the steps he's taken this year as far as the vesna conversation yeah, I I don't know. I we'll see where it all comes out in the wash. <laughs> and and I you know I'd go by the numbers that you know a peer of ours, uh, you and I, Paul Campbell had, hmm. um, you know, looking at statistics from Clearsight Analytics because I think you require that level of breakdown to truly understand how much shot quality means. He's clearly getting he's under barrage there. Yeah. Um, and that's got to be tough mentally. I, I don't think we can underestimate how tough that is mentally on a goaltender. Uh, to be in that situation long term, and I give him credit for how well he's played, and, and he probably deserves to be in the conversation. But I'll be honest with you, I, the way Marty talks about the way he plays, I had the same questions earlier in his career. Some of them I think he's gotten better with, mm. but you know, not to the point where I think you you ignore it completely. You know, and and I'm not going to call him out. It was on the record, um, but I had a, a pretty you know, <laughs> it, it, I had a I had a really big name goaltender as a real student of the game, and just in a in a quote, you know, talking about how you play in style and making saves look easy, and he essentially said, "I'm not going to name him because even like I said, it was on the record, but there's no point." Yeah, but he, he basically said, like, and this kind of goes to Biron's point, like you can you can play a certain way that's not going to look flashy, or you can play like John Gibson and open <laughs> up on everything and make every save look spectacular. And so, you know, in defense of Biron, there are a lot of his peers. Um, I say a lot of, but at least one of his peers who, you know, is an elite level goaltender who kind of looks at it the same way. And um, his, actually to me, one of the most remarkable things is I didn't think he'd have this, he'd be able to stay healthy and he has. So credit to him and his ability to perform at this level, despite all that, like his, his innate skill and his reads and the things he does to compensate for the fact that there are these inefficiencies in his movement that are demonstrable and 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 make his life make his own <laughs> life tougher, like that's how remarkably talented this guy is. And in some ways, this is what we love about goaltending. Yeah, there is, there is no right or wrong. There are no absolutes. I can't t- like I can look at the tape and say, oh man, I'd like to change that. But look at the results because hmm. because they're impressive, and and he makes it work. At an, at an elite level. So, you know, who am I to say who's right or wrong in this? I'll just say that there are guys around the league who, you know, express similar sentiments to what to what Marty Biron said when it comes to watching John Gibson play. Speaking of uh, positive results, Carter Hart in Philadelphia doing pretty well during his first 16 games in the NHL. Just a quick word on what you made of, uh, of Hart's performances so far for the Flyers. Really impressed. Uh, not surprised. I uh, do think we have to grain of salt some of this a little bit. Um, yeah. n- not in terms of, well, yeah, and I just don't think, not in terms of, hey, Carter Hart's, uh, like, not to diminish anything he's done. Just like it probably wasn't fair to me, like, I didn't mean to, it wasn't the intent, was it to min- diminish anything John Gibson did? Because um, the results speak for themselves. Yeah. But if you, if you, you know, I've seen some of the, you see some of the heat maps and some of the shot charts for Hart and, you know, it seems that as as incredible as this might be to believe, the Flyers have actually defended pretty well in front of him. Mm. I did Flyers in good defense. I know those two <laughs> things have traditionally gone hand in hand. Um, you know, but looking at some of those numbers, they've they've kept the house, for mm. lack of a better term, pretty clean. Um, so they've eased him in, and which is kind of what you would hope a team would do with a twenty year old goaltender is try and right. not and try not to put him in front of a firing squad early. But there are elements of his game, and I've ha- I've been uh, privileged enough to be on the ice with with Carter at Hockey Canada camps in a in a video consulting role and see firsthand some of the things he does that put him at a, another level. There are elements of what he does that is sort of the future of goaltending uh, in many ways. Um, in terms of top down movement, prioritizing uh, early set and early angle in movement, that. I don't think a lot of people fully understand, but it manifests itself in comments like "cool, calm, and collected." And you know, we go to the we go to the cliches because that's right. the end result. Yeah. But how he does it, many of those things, is different than how people have done it traditionally in the past. He's exceptional at moving into pucks, 
rather than pulling off of pucks in terms of closing off the release. Um, there will be times where it looks like he's passive with his hands and pucks just beat him around the edges, um, and that's part of it. And, and to me, the important thing will be uh, not trying to change him. Maybe get the hands, you know, there'll, there'll be a temptation to get the hands freer, and maybe that's legit. They've already adjusted the glove position a little bit. Um, but there are going to be, like, desperation for the sake of desperation. Um, there are times where his efficiency can almost look slow to the untrained eye, and trying to get him to get more desperate in situations where he doesn't need to be will be something they'll have to avoid and he'll have to avoid. Um, doesn't mean you can't go outside of the box when you need to, but recognizing when that is and that he has an ability to beat things without going outside of the box and stay inside his box, for lack of a better term, longer than other goaltenders because of the way he moves mm. um, is a strength and not a weakness. At the end of the day, the other thing, you know, like the whole 20 years old and should be in the AHL and you're going to ruin Like, if you're worried about ruining Carter Hart, you haven't been paying attention to Carter Hart. <laughs> um, this is a kid who has trained with John Stevenson, who is most famous, obviously, for being Braden Holtby's sort of mental performance coach mm -hmm. since he was 12 or 13 years old. Um, he's got an incredible head on his shoulders. He's, for lack of a better term, he's built for this. Mm -hmm. Both some of it is innate, but also the way he's trained talking to him last year like he really felt and he wanted to be careful with how he said it and yet at the same time it it wasn't meant to be um boastful it was yeah. just matter of matter of fact like he felt like he could make this stride this year mm. and yeah there's some adjustment much like we I said earlier di pietro is going to have to adjust to the releases in the nhl and and pro releases but i think once he trusted that everything he does and has done to this stage is going to work against those releases he's actually probably better off in the national hockey league where plays happen the way they're supposed to a lot more often than <laughs> in the american hockey league right, where yeah. where it can be a bit of a you know cluster scramble <laughs> um, rodeo around the net and just a game full of mistakes and once he sort of figured out the, the releases and figured out he could play the way he played um, I'd be in no rush to send him back. Now, hey, if the Flyers start selling assets like crazy and there's no indication they're going to, but if they start mm. shipping off a ton of people and giving up 30 great A's a night, if basically if they turn into the Islanders of last year, <laughs> then, yeah, yeah may, maybe you worry about breaking the kid. But honest to goodness, like, like if you've ever had a chance to talk to him, you, you would quickly realize that many of the preconceived notions about young goaltenders we have, like, like, this kid's going to break a lot of those molds, and I'm not surprised at all that he's having having the success he is um, this early in his career. And, and, and there's a part of me, as much as I wasn't, ag I'm not at all against the American Hockey League as a place to start him and give him time. Like, what's the rush for a team that's not ready to compete? I don't think. Um, there's a part of me that says if you had given him more rope because he had success in the preseason, mm. um, that he could have made this adjustment right out of training camp and um, and had this, maybe not quite this level of success, um, but, but but close to it. I, I, I think he could have done this even earlier. Just to finish, uh, Kevin, something you touched on earlier on is, is the way the game has changed uh, and playing goal in the NHL now. I mean, it, is the way the, the things are trending with the speed and, and maybe the more openness? I mean, they say defense is that much harder. Obviously, they changed the, the pants and the chest armor for the goaltenders, which were especially the chest armor big adjustments. I mean, is this is this shift signaling the end of the road for some older style or older goaltenders? Do you think? I mean, I'm not necessarily naming names, just just the way things are changing and, and where they are in their careers. Are we going to see some? previously well-established goaltenders just out of the league sooner than we expected? I'm not sure, honestly. I, I'm really not. Um, I, I think that the one thing I will say is uh, we're seeing some younger guys get shots that we weren't, you know, I don't know in the past. I think, well, I mean, forget the past. I think even this year, there, you know, whether it's Carter Hart, um, Blackwood um, in Jersey, uh, Jordan Bennington with the Blues. Um, we're seeing, I mean, uh, Cal, 
Cal Peterson uh, with the Kings when Quick was out. Like we're seeing younger goalies have success. Uh, Demko's up, obviously hurt now, but but he's getting an opportunity finally. Um, that trend towards younger skilled forwards and skilled defensemen that is fueling this rise in offense. Not just the skilled forwards because. They are more dynamic, and they are learning how to open up goaltenders and, and, and deceive with shot releases and things like that. But also, like the league has gone to skilled defensemen, and that is at the expense, not, not just because it creates offense, but they're not all great defenders, and that's at the expense <laughs> of, of quality chances for yeah. goaltenders. Braden, Braden Holtby uh, put it to me early this season in a really good terms. He's like, one of my favorite guys to play behind ever was Carl Alsner. And Carl Alsner isn't even in the league anymore, despite having a good contract. Like, can he play in the league? Like, that's changed. Like, that's, and so this new style of game that we're hearing about veteran goaltenders having to adjust to. You talk to the younger guys, and I did uh, for for one of the NHL dot com on mass columns. Mm -hmm. Like, this is what they grew up with. Like, talk to Thatcher Demko. Like, his first year at Boston College. Um, one of the li- one of the lines on that team that he saw every day in practice featured Kevin Hayes and Johnny Gaudreau. Hmm. So you know, two guys that are changing, you know, that have that dynamic offensive ability. Gaudreau especially, and I think Hayes an underrated guy in terms of the ability to create the type of offense that that leads to goals in the league these days. Um, he he grew up with it, and he's like hmm. like. I grew up facing breakaways and two <laughs> two on ones. Like he's like, I've never played behind a one four. Mm. Like that's so so. There's an element of that in terms of the older goalies. Like yeah, so that means they're adjusting more. They have a bigger adjustment to this game. Um, does it phase guys out though? Like to me, the best guys have always been the ones that adjusted. Like it's no coincidence. We've seen whether it's Mark Andre Fleury, Henrik Lundqvist, Roberto Luongo. Like they've never rested on their laurels they've Mm -hmm. never stood pat and said okay this is good enough they've always looked for the next thing and so their ability to make adjustments uh, i think they still have that's part of what's gotten them to this stage and they will make adjustments and part of the adjustment now is mentally i've talked to stefan wade the canadians goaltending coach about Mm -hmm. having to try and get carried to adjust to the new norm in terms of numbers because some guys look at their numbers (laughs) and you know when the save percentage around the league drops five percent this year uh, or four or five percent, and, and like six, seven percent over the last two seasons. Like, what's considered a good outing changes, and you have to change your mindset mm. uh, as a goaltender as well. So, the one question I have, and we're seeing it with Schneider, and like he's always been a neutral depth goaltender, mm. played played three quarters in the crease, had a lot of success that way, and he's obviously struggled. They've been well documented, like yeah. he like. You know, and talking to some people that are close to him and around him, they, like his confidence evidently is just shattered. And I think you see when guys start grasping at straws with equipment a little bit. We've seen him switch brands and now switch back this year. Like part of that is just fi- trying to find a comfort level between your ears as much as between the pipes. And clearly between the ears has become an issue. Again, not just from the outside, but talking to people that are close to him with the devils. But part of me also looks at him and says, okay, like in a game where more offense is created right in front of the net, in the slot, in the middle of the ice, where it's harder to take that away than ever before, can you succeed as a goaltender playing neutral depth? And he plays neutral depth because he's not dynamic with his movement laterally. Like, he's not exceptionally quick side to side. I don't know if he can be a top-of-the-paint guy. I don't know if he has the speed to pull that off. And so that's – I hate to use him as an example because it may be cherry-picking and it's easy because of the lack of success. I mean, don't forget he had the hip surgery. The other thing is I thought he looked really good in the playoffs, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so everybody looks at the calendar year or whatever between wins in the NHL or however long it's been, but, like – I thought he played really good when he came in against Tampa Bay. So maybe maybe none of maybe this is just a bad streak and it's all between the years. But I do wonder if you can get away with you know, we've seen Lundquist even transition off the goal line more. I'm not mm-hmm. sure you can play a passive game anymore and have a high level of success in the NHL. Talbot's another guy that I look at and think, uh, you know, I wonder like okay, mm-hmm. how much of this is the Oilers consistent inability to defend even with Ken Hitchcock <laughs> and 
you know, Talbot will not, you know, if Talbot goes elsewhere and succeeds, he sure as hell won't be the first Oilers goaltender to be oh, yeah. better after he leaves <laughs> that system. Hello, Devin Dubnik and Laurent Brassois. Yeah. But, you know, again, more of a three-quarter depth guy. I'm not sure he's the most dynamic lateral goaltender I've ever seen, and, and he's had some struggles over the past year or so. So I'm not willing to say that's an absolute trend. As I said, that's what we love about the position. There are no absolutes, hmm. but it's certainly a trend that I've got my eye on goalies that were more dynamic in the past and played a little looser and i used to look at them and say that's not sustainable because there's no consistency to it Mm -hmm. some of them have had more success than i anticipated they would and and i wonder if that is because they're dynamic because they're aggressive at times because you can't just play three quarters sit back neutral and force teams to beat you around the edges because the reality of today's offensive attacks is they're going to find ways to do that. They're going to get the kind of looks. I mean, you give guys time and space, and outside of Henrik Lundqvist and maybe Carey Price at his peak, I don't care the puck's going in. Just look at the All-Star game. Um, and we're getting more All-Star game-type looks mm-hmm. more often around the league. Awesome. Kevin, thank you very much for doing this uh, the back-to-back episode with me. Is there anything you want to promote, tease, where can people find you, etc., before we go? Oh, I mean, uh, I guess Kevin is in goal on Twitter, which will feed you to all the things we do at InGoal and NHL.com. Um, obviously, shameless plug for the InGoal uh, new podcast that we've started. And yeah, I mean, I think if anything, Rob, I should be thanking you. Anybody who puts <laughs> up with me talking for this long, um, I don't know. Like, I guess over there it would be knighthood. You should have. I think. I think somebody <laughs> ought to, you know, down on one knee and a tap of the sword on each shoulder buddy because uh that's yeoman's work for listening to me for this long (laughs) kevin thank you very much I'll, i'll let you go and enjoy the rest of your day perfect thank you sir